Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks on Saturday, the second day of June 2012. This is episode 879. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by ShareFile.com. Enhance your workflow and send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile from Citrix. Try it today for 30 days free and double storage by visiting ShareFile.com, clicking the radio microphone, and using the offer code TECHGUY. And by Ford, giving customers the power of choice with a full line of electric and hybrid electric vehicles. Learn more about Ford electric vehicle technologies at Ford.com slash technology. Well, hello, how are you? Good to see you. Welcome. It's time for the Tech High Program. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy, and uh, this is the show where we talk about gardening. No, uh, tech. Oh, it's aptly named, I guess. Anything with a chip in it, whether it might be a computer or the internet, or I guess software doesn't have a chip in it, but it uses chips, so anything that uses a chip, too. Of course, we talk about cell phones a lot, and uh, home theater. In fact, our home theater guru, Scott Wilkinson, is... Up uh, on deck at 33 past the hour. Got a lot to do today. But first, let's talk about the most sophisticated malware ever written. And it's out there floating around. It's called Flame by some, Flamer by others. There's many names, but it's all essentially the same thing. It is 20 megabytes, (laughs) includes its own built-in SQLite, SQLite database engine. It uses the Lua programming language, the same language used to write such software as Lightroom for Adobe and uh, World of Warcraft scripting. It is undoubtedly the sister virus to something we know as Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a virus created to shut down the nuclear uh, capability of Iran by the U.S. and Israeli governments. And uh, experts who look at this flame virus say this has got to be written by a government. The cyber wars have begun. Stuxnet, interesting story, was never intended to escape, but it did, and infected many of us. It was designed to uh, actually crash the centrifuges at the Iranian nuclear plants. We're finding out now the details about it from a new book that just came out. David Sanger, or it's just about to come out, called Confront and Conceal Obama's Secret Wars and the Surprising Use of American Power. The article in the New York Times yesterday uh, is an excerpt from that book, and it finally uh, reveals for the for the something we've all suspected for the first time that in fact Stuxnet was written by government. It was only supposed to work within Iran's Natanz refinery refinery uh, facility because the Iranians were very careful and they made sure that that facility was not connected to the outside world or the internet. It was what they call air-gapped. That means there's no wire going from inside to outside. However, the NSA and I presume the CIA figured if we could only get computers, memory cards, or perhaps USB keys in there, we could we could carry the virus inside. George W. Bush first authorized the program. U.S. national labs are testing bits of the plan to sabotage Natanz. Although it was on a need-to-know basis, so many of the programmers, the hackers writing this virus for the government, for the feds, had no idea what it was supposed to do. But they had borrowed centrifuges from Gaddafi. And, uh, or maybe not borrowed, it's not quite the... Confiscated 
similar centrifuges from Qaddafi. So they uh, they figured out a way to literally shake the centrifuges apart with a virus. But they needed a double agent. This is a quote from the book. Getting the worm into Natanz was no easy trick. The United States and Israel would have to rely on engineers, maintenance workers, and others, both spies and unwitting accomplices with physical access to the plant. This was our holy grail, one of the architects of the plan said. It turns out there's always an idiot around who doesn't think much about the thumb drive in their hand. Ouch. In fact, thumb drives turned out to be critical in spreading the first variants of the computer worm. Later, more sophisticated methods were developed to deliver the malicious code. It was never intended, however, to get out into the public. When Obama came into office, the program continued uh, under the code name Olympic Games. But in 2010, Stuxnet escaped. We, we think, this is a quote from one of the briefers who told the president, we think there was a modification done by the Israelis. It wasn't us. They did it. We don't know if we were part of that activity. Mr. Obama, according to officials in the room, asked a series of questions, fearful that the code could do damage outside the plant. The answers came back in hedged terms. Mr. Biden fumed. It's got to be the Israelis, he said. They went too far. Yeah. You know anybody any any malware author worth his uh, <laughs> worth his salt knows that these things always escape. They always escape. You can't contain them. <sighs> Obama repeatedly expressed concerns at any American acknowledgement that it was using cyber weapons, even under the most careful and limited circumstances, or not, could enable other countries, terrorists or hackers, to justify their own attacks. We discussed the irony more than once, one of his aides said. And, of course, the Chinese, when we've accused them of doing the same, say, what are you talking about? You're doing it. And we say, oh, no. Who oh, no. And the cyber war has begun. And it's being run as incompetently <laughs> as the clandestine war has been run for years. Ma and now, flame. Malware recently found infecting Middle Eastern networks is so complex and sophisticated. I'm reading from an article in Ars Technica. Based on research from Kaspersky Labs, a Russian antivirus facility. Dan Godin writing about this. So, so complex and sophisticated that it's probably an advanced cyber weapon unleashed by a wealthy country to wage a protracted espionage campaign on Iran. And of course... Everybody knows, everybody reads between the lines, a wealthy country. It's either Israel or the U.S. Who else? They did the, they did, they've done it before. Then there was Dooku, remember? <laughs> Another one written by government. Now what happens is the code leaks out, the virus leaks out, the bad guys analyze it and say, this is nicely written, let's take advantage of it, and they add their own features. Iran's computer emergency response team, they've got one too, confirmed the outbreak of flame in an advisory published this Monday, this past Monday. The UN's International Telecommunications Union warned members that flame represents a dangerous espionage tool that could be used to attack critical infrastructure. Now that it's out, of course, any country can use it. <laughs> there you go. Enjoy. Ah. Uh, apparently used to destroy data belonging to Iran's oil ministry. This is, a, you know, I mean, it's it, it, on, the, on the face of it, it's kind of clever, you know. You, Iran's building nuclear weapons, there seems to be. You can't really bomb them because that would lead to a shooting war. You could, but it, it's risky. So let's send in the viruses with full deniability, except that now everybody knows. Discovered this new one, Flamer, discovered by a Hungarian uh, lab called Crisis. They call it Skywiper, same thing. It may have been as act active for as long as five to eight years, maybe more. They think it's an international collaboration, not just one country. There are 20 modules for this giant anti-Iranian malware with a menu of highly advanced spying capabilities. 
One plug-in turns on the internal microphone of infected machines, so Skype mon uh, conversations can be secretly monitored in real time. A separate module scans nearby Bluetooth-enabled devices for names and phone numbers in the contact list. A third monitors machine activity by taking screenshots every 15 to seconds. And if they're using Outlook, it just mails it out. Otherwise, it uses an SSL-protected connection to send the images back to the attackers. Flame can also sniff traffic passing over local networks for usernames, passwords, and more. Nice job, NSA. Thanks for letting that out in the wild. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Your call's next. Tech Guy Show today brought to you by uh, Citrix. Actually, the podcast version is brought to you by Citrix, the folks who do ShareFile. I have been using ShareFile now for some time. You know, remember I had a little episode with one of the radio stations i was using dropbox and uh the 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 production director there kept racing the commercials that i was putting in the dropbox as i was putting them there and i said what what are you doing and he said well they're taking up space on my hard drive and i thought there's got to be a better way and thank goodness thank goodness right just about then citrix came along with share file this is designed for business a way to share files uh, not email. It can look like email. If you use Outlook, actually, they have an Outlook plugin, so it makes it look just like you're emailing these files, but you're not. You completely control how files are shared. You could upload files as big as 10 gigabytes. That's bigger than almost anybody. Uh, you have your, your, your folder. I'll show you my share file because what's nice is it, they cut, you can customize it with your uh, company logo and so forth. Let me just log in before I... Why didn't it log in? Don't you remember your password? Oh, that's not it. Well, I would. Well, I could kind of show you. You can at least see the uh, the logo here. And when people download here, I'll I'll show you what you get. So, you have two ways you can do this. You can you can give people access to the folder. You can even require that when they download a file from the folder, it, they give you an email address or and it can notify you. So I get emails all the time uh, that you know to say, oh, he downloaded the file. So then you can, you know, you know if they're getting the files and so forth. Uh, you get a, you can also get a dedicated HTTPS link to your file, and then it looks like this. It looks very professional. And they just click the download link. It's a really great way to share large files. We're all working nowadays in business with much larger files. You see 59 megabytes here. I, and I can't email that to somebody. It's just not practical. Sharefile.com. It's from Citrix. Here's the deal. Go to sharefile.com right now. Take the tour if you want to know more about the features. It is HIPAA compliant. And if you decide you want to try it out, click that listeners click here logo and use the offer code TECHGUY. T E C H G U Y. Okay? They do have different uh, sharefile setups for different industries. If you want to take advantage of that, you don't have to. I just use a generic sharefile. Uh, I love the access control. You could use your iPhone or your iPad to access files. World-class support. It is business file sharing. And when you use my name or use the tech guy code, you get double storage as well as 30 days free. Sharefile.com. Really do like it a lot. Ah, a little Beetlejuice. Very quick, Kyle. You're very quick. Kyle Benham, our musical director, picking up on the fact that one of the modules of that new mega malware that's floating around is called Beetlejuice. <sighs> 8888 Ask Leo is my number if you want to call and talk about this. You know, I, I mean, I'm sympathetic. The choice was uh, either to create a, you know, to, to start a shooting war in the Middle East or see if we can bring those nuclear plants down in Iran the enrichment plants, before they were able to uh, get a nuclear weapon. So I'm sympathetic. It's kind of a shame it, uh, it escaped. <laughs> it started replicating all over the world. It's got to be the Israelis. <laughs> That's Joe Biden. It's got to be the Israelis. Oh, 8888-ASK-LEO. The, the website is techguylabs.com. By the way, it was successful. Stuxnet actually destroyed over a thousand centrifuges in the uh, 
Iranian enrichment plants. So it worked. Sort of. I mean, you know, I, I don't, it slowed him down. Didn't put him out of business. Just slowed him down. The intent was, this is a participant in the attacks, a quote from the Times article. The intent was that the failures should make them feel that they were stupid. <laughs> the virus should have said, neener, neener, neener. I mean, if you really, you want to humiliate them. To, they wanted the uh, scientists in the nuclear enrichment plants to feel that they were stupid, which in fact apparently is what happened. Uh, according to uh, this article. <laughs> they had something they called the horse blanket, a giant fold-out schematic of Iran's nuclear production facilities. It was created with the worm. The worm actually mapped the facilities before it attacked them. It's very um, sophisticated stuff. Very interesting stuff. When a few centrifuges failed, the Iranians would close down whole stands that linked 164 machines looking for signs of sabotage in all of them. They overreacted, one official said. We soon discovered they fired people. Wow. Wow. They took out wor working centrifuges as well as non-working ones. So I guess it did slow them down. It's cool. Turns out there's always an idiot around who doesn't think much about the thumb drive in their hand. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number, 888 827 5536. You can uh, find the website at techguylabs.com. That's where everything we talk about, including this article, ends up. So you can uh, get the links, follow up if you should choose. Our first call of the day is John in West Los Angeles. John Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I'm getting ready to replace my eight-year-old XP computer that I built, and I bought a copy of Windows 7 OEM, and I got to look into at the EULA and some of the stuff online, and I don't know what the story is. I wonder if you could straighten it out. Which part of the uh, EULA end user license agreement worries you? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm self in the building. Right. I'm not selling it you understand anybody. that what an OEM version of Windows is is designed for somebody, a company, you know, presumably that's making a computer. But companies like Egghead and others will sell you one if you buy like a motherboard. That makes you an OEM. So I've I've used it in the past. The XP machine was an OEM, and yeah, I had no problem with fine. it at all. It's how they get. It's how it's it's you know. I think it's a gray area. Is that what you're worried about, this thing that you may not use it unless you're a hardware manufacturer? No, not that so much. It uh, it's, uh, says it's tied to the motherboard. The machine that I've That's got right. right now, after about three months, the motherboard uh, was discovered to have a bad chip in it, and Asus replaced it. Now, if that same sort of thing happens this time, am I going to have to go out and buy another copy of Windows? Ah, That's interesting. Uh, it does tie itself to the motherboard. That's accurate. I think what would happen is that you would call Microsoft and say, I've replaced the motherboard. I have an OEM version of Windows. It's now locked, saying it's an unauthorized edition. Could you unlock it? And they will do that. That's That's been our experience. Okay, so... In other words, you don't have to you don't have to say I bought this OEM edition. You can say I had a machine built for me. The motherboard failed. I've replaced the motherboard, but now Windows won't work. Help, and they'll just un you know there are so many false positives with the Windows genuine advantage. Microsoft, by its own admission, said about five percent false positives. That means about one in twenty machines reports that it has pirated pirated word window, Windows on it, even though it doesn't. So when you call them, they're you know. They, this is what they do all day. Yeah, okay. I'll okay. Like it for you. <laughs> all right, all right. So I don't need to worry. No, I wouldn't worry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're not alone. And, you know, it is a little bit of a gray area. I think Microsoft, you know, they look the other way. The main thing is probably from their point of view is they don't have to support it. When you get an OEM version of Windows, you're supposed to go to the OEM. Uh... Now, remember uh, that the one of the things that Microsoft... I just hate anti-piracy measures, by the way. Microsoft's paranoia about getting ripped off began in practically on day one when Bill Gates 
went to the Homebrew Computer Club back in the very earliest days of Microsoft when it was like five people in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He went to the Homebrew Computer Club and said to the Homebrew Computer Club, you guys are ripping me off. <laughs> I, I, you're, when you circulate the paper tape with basic on it, you're ripping me off. He was mad. He wrote a letter. He said, stop it. And, and that kind of paranoia is built into the company. And here's the upshot of that. Very often when you buy a computer, you don't get a copy of Windows because if you did, maybe you'd steal it because you are thieves. We all know that. So that's, you know, that's a problem. A computer without an operating system disk is, in my opinion, severely hobbled. Problem number one. Problem number two, this kind of thing. They, they don't have just one. They have two anti-piracy measures on every copy of Windows. Two authentication systems. Not one, two. Because they know that we're all thieves. And their system doesn't work. One in 20 people are excused of being a thief, even if they're not. So what happens? So you call them up. You say, I don't understand it. I bought this. And they'll unlock it. So how, what good does this thing do? It's just ridiculous. You know what? I, I it, You contrast this. Now, remember, Microsoft is a software company. This is how they make their money. They don't make their money on the hardware. But you do contrast this with Apple's uh, policy with OS X, where... Not only do they give you, uh, you know, a disc on the early versions, on the current version, you can just download it again. You can burn it. You can do whatever you want. There's no copy protection. They say it's an upgrade price, but they never check. I mean, the whole, they just say, fine, yeah, take it, take it, copy. And they charge 30 bucks. Now, I admit, I understand the difference is they're a hardware company. All the money they make is on the hardware. But there's got to be some some happy medium. I really do. I think we know now that copy protection doesn't work. It really doesn't. Uh, coming up, Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guy, in just a little bit. Then we'll get back to the phone. Suana, please, or Sunana, please hold on from Boulder. Laptop C drive says only 644 gigabytes, but it's supposed to be 750 gigabytes. What's the deal? I'll explain. Binary math coming up. Leo Laporte, the e tech guy. Yeah, but what happens, Cap'n, as is often the case, when that burning a copy per computer fails, because it's like six disks, right? What if the disk is bad? What happens? It's just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Oh, thank you for that link. Oh, hold on a second. Give me the link again. No, we're not going to do E3 this year. Yeah, copy protection works, says Padre SJ, if you're trying to piss off the people who bought the software, because the pirates just take it out. Exactly. Exactly. The only the only people, it's a completely unintended consequence. The only people who are disadvantaged by copy protection are the honest people. All right, let me get uh, Scott on here. Da -da 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 -da. Connect to server. Skype one. I'm now calling Scott on another machine remotely. It's an amazing thing. I would like my usual slot. Now somebody wrote down the the ingredients. Why don't you print salad. that out? Print that out. Hey Scott. Hey, Leo. How's it going, man? It's good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. And what would you like to talk about today, Mr. Wilkinson? Well, I've got uh, a number of reader questions I could answer. I finally Somebody got my wants... screen hung up. What's that? That's, let's see, spinach, lettuce, broccoli, artichoke hearts, mushrooms, olives, chicken, hard-boiled egg, oil, and vinegar on the top. Yes, more vinegar than oil. That is accurate. I'm going to mail that to myself. <laughs> that is exactly what I like. And then pretty soon you'll be able to say the usual, please. I do say the usual. <laughs> you can have balsamic. But, you know, I, I'm just worried. It is balsamic, but I'm worried about what they make versus what I could clearly see is olive oil and balsamic vinegar. So that's just could do a little like this of the olive oil and then this of the vinegar. 
because I like vinegar. I'm a I'm a vinegary guy. <laughs> so, um, have you got me? There I am. There you am. Sam, I am. Sam, I am. I do not so, like green eggs. I will man. bring up one thing. Yeah. I'll save it. Oh, okay. And then we'll go to a question. Surprise me. Yes, my home theater is complete. Ooh. Except the surround didn't work. The Amphony uh, wireless, all I got is... Oh, no, really? Well, I was kind of expecting that. I might have to just run wires. I don't even know if I care that much about surround. Oh, I think you would if you heard it. (laughs) Well, I've heard it. It's not that I haven't (laughs) heard it. I would like it, but I don't... It's not such a big deal that... uh, I don't know. <laughs> you, you, you know. Remember, I'm going from two speakers to 3.1. I mean, right. Well, you, you already I have an improvement. Stepping up, yeah. I'm exactly. stepping up. Here's my leaning tower of home theater. This is. I'm gonna have to get a cabinet or something. Oh, you guys all just pile on <laughs> yeah, top of each other. Yeah. So there's an Apple TV, but it's all, but it's a pyramid, so it's stable. Yeah, there's that's an good. That's Apple good. TV, the Sonos Connect, so that connects my Sonos to my stereo, so I can use the Sonos software with my own stereo. That's a Logitech Review Google TV. That's a PlayStation 3, my, my Blu-ray player. That's the Motorola Xfinity box from Comcast, and there's the Onkyo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. With Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guy. Mr. Scott is the uh, online editor of Home Theater Magazine at hometheater.com. He does those polls every week on home theater and joins us every week to talk about uh, home theater. He also uh, is my regular fill-in host. And we'll get you back soon, Scott. Uh, anytime you like, Leo. I'm you do so s- thrilled to do that. You, uh, it's you, just loads of fun. You do such a good job. Really too good of a job. And, uh, Uh-oh. <laughs> so you could do a little bit less of a good job if you don't mind. Okay, I'll All tone right. it down a bit. <laughs> okay, I'd appreciate it. So I, uh, so I, um, by the way, uh, the company that does home theater, I see, has announced a new website for analog listeners. It's a, it's a turntable site. Exactly right. My friend Michael Fremer, who's going to be on my podcast uh, in uh, week after this co- week after this Monday, so just a little over a week from now, to talk about the new website, AnalogPlanet.com. <laughs> wow. You know, vinyl is making a resurgent yeah, comeback. It's yeah. amazing, yeah. actually. It is amazing. It is indeed. And uh, so, and Michael Fremer is, uh, he is Mr. Analog. I mean, he knows more about turntables and vinyl and, tube amps and all that stuff. In fact, he's in uh, California right now. Normally he's in New York, but I'll say to anyone who's in Southern California who wants to go down to Newport Beach, there's a big audiophile show called THE, the Home Entertainment Show. Uh, you can just look that up online. I don't remember. It's I think it's at a Hilton or a, I think it's at the Hilton Hotel in uh, Newport Beach. Uh, room after room after room of, of audio file goodness. Yeah, I'd love to go to that. But now yeah. I've already I've, I've I've spent my money, <laughs> so it'd be probably a bad thing to to go. I spent I I, I hit the budget. By the way, I hung the uh, to this week uh, Memorial Day. In fact, m- Monday I took uh, took a day and uh, went to the hardware store, got uh, w- you know wire and stuff, and yeah. hung my 120 inch motorized screen. It's really fun to press yeah. the button. And it goes. And I, right, you know, exactly. I, it's very cool. I got a, uh, I got a Harmony uh, One, uh, all, all, you know, uh, universal remote. And I'm, I'm hoping My I can. Remote. Yeah, well, it's a great remote. I, what I wanted to do is because you know you could pre-program like all the. Th- I wanted to press one button and the screen comes down, the curtains come closed, the lights come up, the popcorn pops, and I'm ready. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, I had easily... a very depressing revelation. Uh oh. I'm lying in bed. I'm probably 12 to 15 feet away from this 10-foot screen. And it looks right. great. I mean, I'm enjoying it's about it. about the right size, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And it's, you know, it's a lot bigger than my... I'm looking at the 55 that's behind it, because I kept both. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a... There, good there's, for you. Yeah. Well, yeah, that way during daytime, because it really does need to be dark for this thing to look any good. Yes. Uh, in daytime, I can watch the, the plasma, and then it's crazy. It's just silly. It's a man cave. Let's just face it. No, if if there were a woman around, I'd be out of luck. Yeah, but but it's so cool. So I'm lying in bed and I'm thinking, hmm, hmm. The ang- what do they call that? The angle, uh, the viewing angle. The viewing angle, hmm. yeah. And then I pull out my iPad, my my Retina Display iPad, and 
I hold it up right about arm's length, and it's exactly the same size as that 10-foot screen. That's right. And I'm thinking, you know, I could have saved some money just watch these movies on my iPad. Well, if I want it to yeah. be bigger, just move it a little closer. <laughs> yeah, but then your arms get tired. Well, and it's only for one. It's viewing for one. If you had a, if you exactly. had, if you had somebody else, uh, exactly. you know, you'd be out of now, luck. But I'm the home new iPad alone. <laughs> I hear is like three. <laughs> it's very the new high resolution. Three like K. It's yeah. super high resolution. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but you know, it is. It's viewing for one and. Uh, I don't know. There, I can have it's a party. not very cinematic, you no. know. I mean, if you yeah. going out to the movies, there's something magical about it. And I, you know, people say, "Oh, I don't like the popcorn. I don't like the sticky floors and the kid kicking me back of my seat." Well, I still have that. I actually made the floors sticky. <laughs> <laughs> I I wanted full experience. There's chewing gum under the seat. There you go. No. Okay, good. It's kind good. of nice. It's kind of fun. I have to say, you're you right. Made your neighbor's kid next door to kick the wall. Well, while speaking you're of the TV. neighbors, I mean, that's the one thing is I got to kind of turn the subwoofer down because I was watching Godzilla. Oh yeah. And it's there's a lot of bass, <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh man, they got to think maybe there's an actual Godzilla attack going on here. Well, that that is often the case. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to I wanted to point that out that, that you could put a lot of energy into a home theater, or you can hold your iPad closer to your eyes. Yeah, you could. And you have a 3K screen. Now, not everything's on the iPad. That's the other side of that. So, Well, that's true. And I don't know whether you could stream... Um, what you well, see. you can't see that's mixed like martial movie. arts on the... Uh, and let me tell you, uh, UFC on a 10-foot screen is terrifying. <laughs> I think they're going to kick you in the head. That's right. So Scott likes to... Add, but Oh, one more thing before we uh, before we get to your question from your uh, readers. Uh, I do sure. want to point out your uh, your poll this week just posted... Are you more of an audiophile or video file? Yep. And that's at hometheater.com. And I'm, I, go. you know, I'm a, I, I think I'm more of an audiophile, to be honest. But, uh, but let's see what, I bet you video file is a vast majority. Uh, I think you'll be surprised. Click it and see. Oh, really? Am I allowed to say? Because, uh, you know, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, please do. People are, think that they're, it's equal. 44% said about equal. 27%. And that is the biggest response so yeah, far. Yeah, by far. Uh, but uh, and and those who th who prefer who think of themselves more as audiophiles than videophiles are roughly equal. There's a right. bit more videophile, but not too much. I have been enjoying listening to music though. Once I've got this nice setup, it really sounds good. The music sounds oh, great sounds, too. I'm you get sure both basically by setting up a nice home theater. Exactly. You put the energy. Exactly into it. right. Yeah. Yep. So answer if you will. We have a minute or two. A question from a your quick question. listeners. <clears throat> um, Christopher Vanderhurst uh, says that he's got the upgrade bug on his Denon AVR 1910 receiver, which is hooked up to uh, 5.1 B&W 600 series speakers, which is very good. His priority is Blu-ray. And he asks, which would be better, take buying something like a Pioneer receiver and sending its pre-outs, that, that is its preamp outputs, to an external amplifier, or buy uh, another beefier, bigger, better uh, AVR. So it's now, that's that old question, separates versus... Exactly. Uh, and, yet, and yet I was intrigued by this question because the, he, he specifies an AVR, which has power amplifiers in it, to send, though, the signal to an external power amp. And my question is, why? Well, maybe because it's <clears throat> a better quality to, to have a standalone well, amp. Is that possible? Uh, yes, probably the Emotiva XPA5, which is what he's thinking about in the ex as the terms of the external amp, is probably a better amplifier. But why buy the amplifiers in an AV receiver if you're not going to use them? Can you get the capabilities of an AV receiver without an amp? Yes, absolutely. It's called a preamp processor, ah. and Emotiva makes a very good one, the UMC1, for like 500 bucks. They sell separates. That's kind of what they do. And by the way, those are the speakers I bought for my home theater, the Exactly Emotivas. why I wanted to bring this up. And I like them a lot. This is a company that, uh, it's a U.S. company. They're, I think they're in Tennessee, and they really do great stuff. Uh, yeah, they I really would, do. I, I'm tempted. And you know, I got that. Too. Yeah, fairly. I'm well, I mean... It, it you know you're gonna get a an amp for a thousand bucks and then a preamp for a for another five hundred. I but guess you that's can easily spend five hundred, fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred 1500 1600 bucks and a lot more right. on an AV receiver. Right. The Denon is is like 1200 bucks. So Yeah, exactly. So there you're getting separates and and there are some advantages to separates which are uh when you separate out those two things 
they don't interfere with each other inside the same box. Uh, There's no possibility of it. Uh, AV receiver designers go to great pains to isolate those two functions from each other inside the box, but they're still inside one box. Right. So separating them out is, is a nice thing. Plus, when new capabilities come along, it's easier to replace the preamp processor and keep your amplifier, which isn't going to change technology, you know, amplifiers have been the same for a long time. We now have Class D amplifiers, which is relatively new. But uh, generally speaking, you know, you buy an amp, it sounds good, you like it, keep it. Replace the pre-pro. Scott Wilkinson, he's the online editor at HomeTheater.com. Thank you, Scott. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We'll go back to the phones right after this. So, you know, I figured if... Yeah, if I wanted to upgrade the projector, I'd upgrade the projector. If I wanted to upgrade the uh, the amp, you know, I just could, you know, disassemble and reassemble. Easily. That's yeah. right. I that's, like the that's... Amativa speakers. They're nice. The, they're uh, they sound they're, good. You like them. They sound good. You know, they haven't broken in yet, so I don't know how they're going right. to sound yeah. eventually, but I'm pretty happy with them. Good. Now, I you see, okay, so there's, I'm just looking at, uh, this is one of their uh, pro, preamp pre processors, pre-pros, the UMC-1. It's 7-1. 500 bucks on sale yep. right now. Five HDMI inputs, one HDMI output. Um, that's a little less. You know, it doesn't have the features that this crazy Onkyo does. But uh, oh, Your Onkyo has, what, seven or eight HDMI inputs? Yeah, seven and two out. The two out's nice because then I can have a projector and the TV. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, uh, like, a, you know, this, this Emotiva isn't necessarily for everybody. I was well, I'll to... never fill set. Well, maybe I shouldn't say never. Yeah, you, you're almost there now, <laughs> I got four. I got four. Oh, um, you're going you're gonna to keep getting stuff in to try out. And... Yeah, that's true because then you, I, I, I hooked up the Boxy and the Rook. It doesn't have the MHL HDMI, which is nice. It doesn't have – now, I don't use – it has the built-in uh, Pandora, you know, Spotify stuff, but I don't use that. I use the Sonos for that. Uh -huh. So I don't care about that. Right. The UMC one is really meant more for the, the, the home theater guy who just has, you know, a Blu-ray player and maybe one or two streamers, a game console. Uh, but they're mostly interested in Blu-ray and, and right. uh, maybe satellite. So they've got a new one, the XMC one, which is $1,500, 7.2. Oh. Wow. Uh, and that one... If I, uh, it does have seven in, uh, f uh, four toss links in, mm -hmm. four digital coax in. So they're really focusing on audio here. They even have XLR balanced analog audio in. Wow. Very good. That's for, that's for the aud true audio file. Yeah. Yeah. This is an audio file. It supports SACD. Huh. Which, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard SACD played back really well, multi-channel. Oh, it's really I'd wonderful. Love to. It's just wonderful. It's got 7.2. So two subwoofers. Right. But you still need two... the amp. You don't have an amp here. This just... Correct. This... Correct. Now, the subwoofers presumably would be self-powered. Right. Uh, so you wouldn't need right. the amp, you know, separate amps for those. Right. But um, So then you'd get uh, uh, you'd get an amp that's uh, five that's channels. Seven channels. Well, seven channels. Oh, you need this seven? Thing is seven. You could. You could. You oh, know, yeah, now yeah, I guess you would, more Blu-rays are coming out with a seven. They don't make a seven-channel amp, so I guess you need a, a a five and a two. A five and a two. <laughs> oh, yeah. grimy, grimy. They'll come out light. with a seven-channel amp soon enough, oh, I'm sure. This is a thousand-watt multi-channel amp, five times two hundred, I guess. Oh my god. Oh my god. See, I'm not going to do this. I can't. Yeah. See, my, at the, my age, I can't. I, <laughs> it's fine with me. Fine with me. Uh, all right, Scott. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Who's on the uh, show on Monday? On Monday is a guy named Ron Williams. He's a consultant to the film industry, and we're going to be talking about 4K versus 3D. Great. So that, that's what that I want to listen great. to. You bet. Which side is and he then, on? Uh, <laughs> you'll have to tune in and oh. find out. <laughs> You mean. All right. Hey, thanks, right. Scott. My pleasure. Talk to you later. Yeah, I should have. I, sh I could have saved a lot of money had I just gone with headphones and an iPad. That's all you really need. The Onkyo does have 4K upscaling. If I get a 4K projector, I'm set.
Oh, I will never say your name. Don't worry, Mr. Microsoft. Your secret is safe with me. Here comes Godzilla. <laughs> and a Thank you. carbonite library. All right. You can, you can even hear the bass in this. Oh, that's just Zilla. That's the little baby. I have to admit, Godzilla, which is the only movie I've watched on this big screen, not not a great that the one with Matthew Broderick, not a great movie, but boy, uh, it filled the room, especially when the Godzilla goes boom, boom, boom. Scott's a guest on Monday. He does the Home Theater Geeks podcast every Monday, one thirty Pacific, four thirty Eastern time, on uh, Twit.tv. And Scott's uh, Scott's guest will be Ron Williams, who is a consultant to the motion picture industry and a debate 4K screens versus 3D screens. I mean, really, it's a it's a false dichotomy because you probably will get be able to get do both when you get a finally get 4K monitors. But 4K, I'm excited about 4K. I like 4K. It's twice as uh, twice the resolution horizontally and twice the resolution vertically of an HD TV. And it's very real, very beautiful. Can't get it yet. Someday. Uh, Sunana in Boulder, Colorado. Thanks uh, for your patience, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Sunana. Hi, Leo. Thank you for taking my call. It's of course. always such a marvelous opportunity to talk to you. Oh, aren't you kind? Um, I did a lot of research on your Tech Guy Labs website and recently bought an Asus laptop. Um, I read that if you you believe they're very durable and that they have a good reputation. Yeah. Um, so I got this great new laptop, and um, I, when I bought it, you know, I went for the four, 750 GB. That's a big um, drive, memory big estimate. hard drive, yes. Right, because um, I actually, I've been on your show before, and you helped me put video on my website, Dinner at Your House. Oh, yeah. And so I wanted to get something, exactly. So yeah. I wanted to get something where we could store our files on the laptop easier and um then i look at the c drive once i get it all set up and it says 744 or 644 gbs so i feel like i got just no, or i no. didn't know what was up and i wanted to take it back to the store but i thought let me call leo first. no i'm so glad you asked this is normal it's very confusing um, it's the difference between a binary numeric system and a digital numeric system. You know, we have 10 f uh, decimal, I mean. We have 10 figures, 10, 10 digits. So we are on a decimal system, 0 through 9, right? And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10. Uh, computers uh, don't have fingers, let alone toes. So they count in what's called a binary system, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Very different. It just and it turns out when they uh, and this is all marketing, but when they tell you the capacity of the hard drive, they use the decimal system because it sounds better. Seven hundred fifty gigabytes, and you'll see somewhere in a very small place you'll see decimal. And then uh, your your operating system is re reporting it in binary. So that's some of that. It's not all of it, but that's some of the seven hundred fifty gigabytes. Some okay. of it is also dedicated um, to a recovery partition, which you do want because you you know when if there's a hard drive crash or whatever, you can rebuild. In fact, did the Asus come with discs? It didn't come with any discs, but it, there is like an automatic backup button on there that says you want to back up now. Yeah, and I haven't messed with it yet. Yeah, you should. So there'll be a chance to make discs from that recovery partition. I would do that. That's one of the first things you should do. So that okay. way you'll have disks, you'll have the recovery partition. You do not want to mess with the recovery partition. You need that. And okay. so what yeah. what they probably should say and probably do in fine print somewhere is say 750 gigabytes, 640 available. Huh. That's that's okay. how much is available to you. That's not on this is not at all unusual. Okay, so nobody gypped me no. 100 GBs. No. And by the way, we don't say gypped because apparently that is a slur on gypsies. Oh, okay. <laughs> are you a gypsy, well, Sunana? Another, <laughs> if you, I, no, I'm not. If you are, you're allowed to say. <laughs> uh, you were ripped off. I do move around a lot, though. <laughs> there you go. You, maybe you're an honorary gypsy. So, um, 
Yeah, it's it's completely normal that, uh, that you you were not robbed, um, and it's not it's not a big deal. Okay, can I ask you another quick question? Sure. Just about video. Okay. Um, what do you what do you think is a better format for video storage, AVI or um, MPEG? A very good question, because they're not mutually exclusive. AVI and MOV, as well as Flash and right. MKV and a bunch of others, are what we call wrapper formats. They're the they're the kind of file format, but they can contain MPEG within them. Uh huh. So uh, it doesn't matter what file format you use, whether you use AVI or Apple's QuickTime Movie or others like Matroshka MKV. All of those are fine. AVI is fine. But I do recommend using a compression or codec, compressor, decompressor, uh, that is called H.264 because okay. that is gives you the best bang for your buck, the best quality. That's, for the, the best, that's the best way to archive your video? Well, I mean, some would say the best way to archive your video is even less compressed, but who has the storage, right? So, right. yeah, I think if you're going to archive it, I think H.264 is a good format. Okay. And uh, you can just store it as H.264. That'll Sometimes that'll be seen as MP4 because it is MPEG level 4. Um, okay. But uh, H.264 is really, right now, the best format, I think, for video. And it's rapidly okay. becoming the default. Uh, you know, most people use it. it Flash uses it. AVI, uh -huh. QuickTime, everybody. And so I think, yes, it's a good format. Okay, great. Well, thank you. You're always such a big help. Well, and let's, I love let's plug you your site. How's show. the cooking show going? It's going well. And we are getting ready to do our first episode in Colorado. All the episodes that we had done before were all in California and Sacramento and San Diego. But since I moved out here, we're getting ready to do an episode out here. And it's probably going to be out at a farm and, you know, just kind of using whatever equipment they have in their farm kitchen. Sounds So great. it'll be new. It'll be cool. Sounds wonderful. I cannot wait. Thank you. Well, good, luck with, so good luck with it. Dinner, you could just Google uh, dinner at your house. Dinneratyourhouse.com, yeah. Dinneratyourhouse.com. It's www.dinneratyourhouse.com. Great, Sonana. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Take bye care. Bye. I'm glad you asked. People often get, you know, confused. I think there were regulations and laws passed so that it does now say digital, or rather decimal versus binary, blah, blah, blah. So that's some of it. You, 750 gigs. See, the, the deal is a megabyte is 1,024 bytes, not 1,000 bytes. 1,024 bytes. That's because it's binary. So what they'll do is they'll pretend <laughs> it's 1,000 bytes. And so it's more gigs, but then when the computer really gets down to it, it's it's less. And then they've got a extra partition. Oh, I, I didn't mention, but there is a way to see what's where your extra hard drive space is going. Uh, Right-click on my computer, select Manage. That's going to open up the Windows Management Console, and there's a Storage tab on the left there. And you can actually click it. You will see the partitioning, the layouts of the drives. You'll see that hidden partition. You'll see what's occupying uh, what. And that, that might set your mind at rest, that you, in fact, have a 750-gig drive. You just don't have all of it available. That's normal. They, they use a little bit. You know, 644 gigs is still a lot. They've taken 100 gigs away from you. It is, it is a shame that they do that. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. And we're talking computers and the internet, cell phones and camcorders, home theater, MP3s, whatever you want to talk about, compression algorithms, binary versus decimal. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number, 888-827-5536, 8888-ASK-LEO, toll free, from anywhere in the U.S., if you're outside the U.S., you can still call toll-free. Just use Skype. Skype out will call a toll-free number for free. You don't use any credits. And we do get calls almost every week from uh, people in England and Asia and all, just all over the world. It's wonderful. I love that. Australia.
which is unusual because it's kind of it's late at night or is it early in the morning? I can never remember. It's early in the morning in Australia. Jim in Temecula, thank you for hanging on. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Jim. Hey, Leo. Thanks for taking the call. Thanks for calling. It's not about binary or compression, but I hope it's a good one. <laughs> it's okay. Um, uh, I'm a teacher, an elementary school teacher, and I have this video project I've been working on the last five years to help my class go smoother. And I've been sharing this video project with my colleagues, and they all think that maybe I should try and sell it. So I think I'm going to venture out this summer and try and maybe sell the thing. But I got a glitch. I, there's, it's a transition video to get my kids to go from station to station in my room, and it uses music. And the music I've been using has been a download of music, which I think is not sellable, right? I need to have yeah. a license for it. You can sell it, but you have, have, yeah, you could sell it, but you'd have to license it, and the license would be prohibitively expensive. That's what I thought, and I don't know if this would take off or not. Now, it's only 30 seconds of music. Do you need to pay for 30 yeah, seconds? Yeah, you need to pay for one stuff? second if you use it for a commercial enterprise. Now, in school... And you probably already know this. I'm sure that you from time to time will Xerox a book and hand out a few pages. There is a fair use exemption for teaching because it's for non-commercial purposes and so forth. So I wouldn't worry so much about something you're going to use in the school. You do not have to clear that stuff. But the minute you start selling something, all bets are off. People get very serious about that. So, I've been looking at the internet, and it's pretty expensive to get a song. Is yeah. there any place you can get, it's called stock music and stock pictures. Can yeah. you get that for free? Yeah, I mean, what you can look for is, um, and, the, and the rights vary, but if you look for, uh, for instance, podcasters use what we call pod safe music. That's music from unsigned artists or artists that say, hey, it's okay for you to use our music. And they'll have different um, rules about that, whether you have to give credit or not, uh, if you can use it for commercial purposes or not. Uh, it just really depends. So, um, a couple of places you can go. You can actually go right to MySpace. A lot of independent artists on MySpace. And if you find some music you like, you can drop them a line and say, hey, may I use this in, and explain what you're using it for. And I think many artists would be glad to say, yeah, as long as you give us credit, we'll be glad. Probably. You know? Yeah, so, glad to do that. Yeah. There's also, um, there are also places to get pod safe music. That's, that's one place to look. There's a... Creative Commons uh, has a uh, site for music, creativecommons.org, where you, music that's licensed using Creative Commons is usually licensed for non-commercial use, but some of it may be. You can actually search, but they have check boxes for commercial purposes. So you can, you can uh, check the boxes as for commercial purposes, and you'll only find music that is licensable inexpensively or free for commercial purposes there's a, a search engine called jam endo j-a-m-e-n-d-o that does that um there's also places that you could buy music fairly inexpensively what they call royalty free music um i have we have an advertiser called pond5 p-o-n-d-5.com that has a lot of music this is a media stock media place and they have a lot of different um, music that you can search in a variety of different formats and it doesn't need to be hugely expensive um the the creator sets the price for it so you can you can you know shop around and see the advantage of doing it this way is it'd be very straightforward if you find music you like you just take it you pay the price and it's yours you know forever so um, sure. some of these are as little as I'm. Here's a, here's an example. I'll play a sample from Pond Five. You can sample all the music, and you hear it has a little watermark in it. Here's one called yeah. June Bug. It's twenty five bucks, one shot, one time only. You never have to pay for it again. So that that's another way to do it. You might find it easier. I I imagine twenty five bucks is not out of the uh, out of the question. No, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. No. Yeah. Is it possible okay to use clip art from Word and PowerPoint and from the office uh, suite? Uh, do they allow you to resell that? Uh, you know, probably, but I'm, I'd have to look. But I, uh, you should look in the license agreement. But I believe it is true that you can use the clip art in Microsoft Office. Does anybody uh, in, the, uh, in the chat room know off the top of your head? I believe it is. 
they have acceptable images that would work if it's if I could use it. Yeah, the problem with using clip art from Office is that everybody recognizes it. <laughs> you know, yeah. they go, oh, I already got that. Now you may not yeah. care. Uh, Pond Five yeah, is another place to look for. You can get that kind of image as well from Pond Five, and it, and it's not quite oh. as obviously uh, uh, clip art from uh, Microsoft Office. It just depends on how much you know energy you want to put into it and stuff. It you know uh, if you start charging for stuff, I would say using Office clip art probably not a it's probably illegal, but it's probably not a good idea. Yeah, there are a lot yeah. of there are a lot of good. What you're looking for is uh, stock stock photos, stock art. Um, mm -hmm. Clip art is uh, kind of these days not much beloved uh, by people. I would take a look at Pond5.com. I'm there. I'm giving them a free plug because they they uh, they don't advertise on the radio show. They advertise on our podcast. But I like them as a company, and I think they are very affordable. And they have a lot of content on there for just a few bucks. All right. Well, that sounds great. Hey, good luck. That's All great, right. Jim. Where do you plan to sell the uh, video? How are you going to sell it? Well, can a teacher says she's doing things on uh, teacherspayingteachers.com. Hmm. And she said she's able to put... Now, that's for teachers and their units, mostly. They'll produce a unit that's uh, useful to other teachers, right. and they just put it up there and, and sell it to another teacher who what wants it. What a great it. idea. I think that's such... It's teacherspayteachers.com, an open marketplace for educators. What a great idea. Because if you put a lot of energy into a lesson plan that only you're, you are using, why not share it with other teachers? Right, and they're only 2 to $5 a lesson plan. Uh, my wife's Great a idea. teacher. She downloads them and pays for them, and other teachers I know. So it's a pretty good resource. So this is kind of like Pond 5 for uh, lesson plans, for curricula. I think that's right. great. I think that's great. Yeah. It just shows you. Yeah. That's Thank you for that uh, tip. I'm going to remember that. Teacherspayteachers.com. It's an open marketplace for educators. Uh -huh. Jim, thank you for being a teacher. Most important, in my opinion, most important job in the world. I love doing it. I bet you do. I bet you it's very satisfying. Right. Thank you, Jim. It has to be because the pay isn't great. Uh, Carol in Los Angeles, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Thanks for taking the call. One is I have the opportunity for a very low price to purchase... Um, the suite, the 2010 Office Suites, and I wasn't sure. Currently, I have Windows XP Professional, and it's pretty old, um, and I wasn't sure which of the Office Suites you would recommend as a replacement, the Professional, the <laughs> Professional Plus. Well, they just have different uh, capabilities, different features. You don't probably need the access database. Uh, you, probably uh, you probably would like Outlook, would like Outlook you, words. words. What you really what want, you, really you know, want, should look because each set has different set has rules different about, about usage, usage and different, and different applications, applications in it. In it. Um, um, when you say when you for say a very low, low price, price, is this from a friend or? Uh, no, it's from work. They have a, I see. an agreement they have a deal. and it's less than $30. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I would just look at a... Uh, let me see if I... Hold on a second. We're going to take a break, and I'll see if I can find a comparison chart. Yeah, you can't turn down the radio because um, it's not from them. You know, the radio echo would be 40 seconds long. It would, it, that's not what that echo is. It's just very annoying. Have we ever, but Kyle, course, have we the tricky part. addressed that again? Because I get so much yeah, echo back uh, on calls now. I Just a ton of it. Found fresh books. It changed my Didn't life. Jim Rome complain about it as well? Online invoicing service. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, the equipment in here is ancient. Um, what do you want me to, to say? Because I'll, I'll send a note right after the show today. Well, it's on the podcast, you know. I mean, so what it is, is on most of the callers now, if you charge by the when I'm talking, I get myself fed back through the channel from to you, also, from you. To save you time for instance, late payment uh, reminders So, whatever's happening in the hybrid, and keep your accountant happy. It's feeding me back to myself. Right now, free at with about a half second delay. 
FreshBooks.com. Right. It oh, used to be only on a few calls, right now. Um, usually the lower level callers, and it's now gotten to the point where it's very loud and it's on almost every call. Software piracy. Now, why did you report software piracy to the Business Software Alliance? Knowing what software takes in terms of the Let me take it out of Program 3 and 4, which sends it through the through the web, which we're not using really. I don't know if that will do it. Yeah, let's try it. Try it. So I just did that, and then you have to have you have to have program here. When in thirty seconds, let's let's pop her back on. And do you want to pop her back on and talk to her for just a quick second? Sure, just to see. Yeah, but give me give me twenty five seconds here. All right, thousands of people every day, but it won't happen to you if you get carbon. Yeah, so we use a forty second digital today. delay. So if, if she had her radio loud, it wouldn't you wouldn't sound black echo. You'd hear the radio show from forty seconds ago. It wouldn't be only fifty. That. What you're hearing is free at an artifact, and it doesn't go out on the air. Today and That's why it's annoying. With they have That's a way Carbonite of doing it without com. putting it out over the today. air, but for some reason they send it back to me. And hey, Leo, you don't think that it could be the bleed at all? Like echoing back? I don't have any, I don't bleed. Have any bleed. microphone? I don't have any bleed. Have any. Oh, so you're, you're, the audio that's coming through Twit of the caller is is uh, not coming out of a speaker. It's coming through your system. Yeah, I'm wearing headphones. And there's no there's no speaker in your studio in no, there? No, no, not anymore. Oh, anymore. okay. Okay, Louise, you can Louise made me Louise. stop doing that. All right, so let me see. So let me see. Um, hey, Carol, are you still there? Oh, no, I didn't have you on. Now you're good. Hi, Carol, are you still there? I am. So um, you're going to help me uh, out a little bit. No, it's still here. I still hear the echo. I'm sorry, to Carol, because we're trying to we're trying to solve a problem in the uh, audio chain, and I'm using you as a guinea pig. I hope you don't mind. Okay. We will go back to your call. <laughs> okay, because I'm on a cordless, and it, it should have a pretty good battery life still. But oh, well, we'll get you in done. In order for me to, to we'll, sit in front of the computer, I'm on a cordless phone. We'll get you done pretty quick. Okay. All right. Yeah, just we're in the middle of commercials. We'll be back in about a minute. Oh, that. Wait a minute. I don't hear anything now. Did you just, oh, fix, did it, you just fix it, Kyle? I just put her on hold. Oh, that's, that's why. why. <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually interesting, Leo. You know how some people, when they're on a landline, especially a cordless phone, that... Uh, it's that not coming from the going. phone. It comes from every call. Oh, every call? You every call. Cell phone? Every right, call. I, I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send Trevor a note, and I'll get uh, Bill. To look <sighs> yeah, Bill it tried to fix it about three, two or two or three years ago, and never did figure it out. I, you know, it's it's something to do with the uh, the hybrid, and it's I, it, it seems to happen more with lower audio levels on the caller, but that's probably because it's just boosting it more. Anyway, here we go. Now I don't hear the music. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. Carol on the line from Los Angeles. Hi, Carol. Hi. So what's your problem? Well, there's there are two. One is just trying to determine um, which of the office professionals to, or office... Oh, that's right. I forgot. You already asked. <laughs> you already asked. That's um, okay. That's the minor problem, actually, or the minor issue. If you Google Office Suite comparison chart, Microsoft has uh, a chart at office.microsoft.com. Which suite is right for you? And it shows you the three different suites and the features, which is really more applications in each. So, for instance, Office Home and Business doesn't have Microsoft Access, which is a database program. You don't need that. It doesn't have. You might want Publisher. That comes only with the professional. So if you okay. if you look at this chart, and I'll also put a link in the show notes at techguylabs.com. If you look at this chart, you'll see what the difference is. Boy, I'm jealous. 30 bucks. That's a great deal. Well, actually, it's less than 30. Wow. Now, of course, um, what's going to happen is the next Office Suite, Office 365, is going to go on, is going to be online. I guess it's Office 14. I don't know what they're going to name it. Uh, is probably going to be available online as a monthly fee. They already offer it kind of Office 365. So 
But I think you know you want a you want a computer with software on it. This is thirty bucks or whatever. Good deal. Yeah, because some of the things that I send home from work, um, I'm not able to open at home right. because the the applications are too old. That's why they give you a deal. Yeah, I bet you it's mostly spreadsheets and word processing, right? Maybe PowerPoint. Well, this is the first time I'm able to get this from home. But yeah, that's what I'm sending back. Yeah, so you could get the simplest version of Office for that. Okay. The other question is more important for me in that I have a Seagate external hard drive. Mm -hmm. And a year or so ago when, or a couple years ago, when I installed it, it was working fine. Um, My brother-in-law came over one day and he saw that my Norton backup wasn't uh, turned on. And I said, I didn't want it on. (laughs) And he said, well, it won't matter. So ever since he turned that on, whenever I run the Seagate, I then look at the the report, and everything is either skipped or errors. Okay. Okay. Can you still just copy stuff to the hard drive, like drag stuff over? To the external hard drive? Yeah. I've never tried that. Well, try that just that. to see if we can still write to the hard drive. I sus- So here's the deal with backup. You, th- those reports... Uh, are usually saying, well, that file was busy, that file was in use, that file is a cache file, I don't want to copy that. So the files that it's skipping are probably files you don't want to back up anyway. I would ignore that, as long as the hard drive continues to work. Well, there are my photos, everything... You know, it's not copying anything? Well, nothing is showing. It's either skipped or error. And if you look at... Now, can you look at the external hard drive and see if there's anything there? Um, okay, hold on. I just, this is, I'll tell you right off the top. I hate Norton backup. Well, I didn't want to turn it on, so um, but I you do, that. you do want to back up, but I think but, Nor- what I don't like is a backup program that doesn't let you see what you what it's what you got. You should be able to open up that hard drive and see all your files there, even open them to see if they're copied properly. And most backup programs, Norton included, make a big blob that you can't really see. Well, I'm looking on the Seagate backup. That's what I wanted to see if things were backed up to that. Norton is... the external. Yeah, I understand. Norton's the software that's doing it. So look oh. at the Seagate and see what you see on the Seagate. Do you see anything on the Seagate? Can you copy a file to it? We want to see if the hard drive is working. Norton is just junky software. Um, I don't want to get between you and your tech guy, however, because... He's the your go-to guy for support. You need him. So if he likes Norton, you might want want to keep using it and call him though. Don't call me because I can't. <laughs> I don't. I don't like Norton. It's terrible. It's a junkie. Uh, but on the other hand, it might be the way you know. If he's supporting you, that's the way he wants you to back up. You should ask him. Well, why is it not? But what you can do now is go to my computer, open it up, look at the Seagate drive, see if the files that you thought it was backing up are actually there. I think it's a big blob, so that's not going to be much help. And then just take a file and copy it. Just drag it over and see if it drags over. If it does fine, then the hard drive's still working. Norton's probably complaining because there are some files that are busy or for whatever reason they can't copy anymore. Gary in San Diego, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. Hi, Leo. Uh, thank you for taking my call. And uh, I had a question concerning uh, Firefox uh, add-ons. And uh, I was uh, trying to click on, uh, I guess, uh, for example, for an add-on would be uh, Browser Protect. And uh, when I click on that, then a separate uh, pop-up window right. uh, comes up and says... Uh, do you wish to download, I guess, uh, Browser Protect Premium to protect all the other browsers on my computer? Oh, no, that's annoying. They're just trying to make a little money on you. Most Firefox add-ons are free. Oh, um, okay. Uh, I don't know. You know, the, the developer wants you to give him 10 bucks for it, and then he's trying to make a little extra money by saying, hey, you can get the pro version. Eh. What Browser Protect claims to do is alert and block browser hijacks on your Firefox. If you, do you uh-huh. have security? Do you have any any virus software running? Yeah, I have ESET. Yeah, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. They're just making, you know, I guess. It's just a it's, it's a security program. You really want, uh, you know, the the one security. Uh, first of all, adding uh, add-ons to Firefox really can bog it down. Mm-hmm. So you want to be judicious about what you add, just not add willy-nilly. 
There's one uh, brow- Firefox browser add-on that our security guy Steve Gibson loves and does ask for money, but it is free software. It's called NoScript. Oh, now, NoScript. NoScript is very aggressive. NoScript basically says no scripting allowed unless you explicitly say so. That means no JavaScript, no Java, no Flash. This will do more than browser protect. But one of the reasons I don't use it, and it's absolutely free, one of the reasons I don't use it is because it's so aggressive, I got tired of all the warnings. But, boy, if you want to protect yourself from browser malware, no script. That is an amazing program. Oh, okay. Oh, can I ask you one more question? Sure, Gary. Okay. Uh, well, I guess it's a comment, but then uh, why is, uh, I guess, Verizon being uh, doing a Netflix in terms of ending their, you know, unlimited data plan? And, you know, Every, everybody is doing that. AT&T, yeah. the, 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 C, the CEO, the chairman of AT&T, was his name, Randall Stevens, said the biggest mistake he ever made was offering unlimited data for the when the iPhone came out. He deeply, yeah. deeply regrets it because, you know, it's a limit on how much money they can make. Uh, yeah. the, the, what they're saying and what I believe is the case do not agree. But here's what they're saying. Oh, you uh-huh. know, we can't afford to give you unlimited data. People are using much more data than we thought they would. So what we're going to do is throttle you, AT&T's case, throttle you if you go over just a couple of gigabytes a month. And what we're going to try to do is to get you to pay for that because it's so expensive for us. Now, it's true in wireless, you know, it is more expensive. Uh, They claim people are using more. I think it's just pure greed. Simple enough. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Our caller, uh, who was having trouble uh, with Norton backup, Uncle Bick in our chat room, who's always been a great help, suggests a program called Cobian. He said, and and this is absolutely something I look for in a local backup. You know, we, I I usually just use synchronization software and so forth, but Cobian backup does one thing that I really like that Norton does not do. It doesn't make a blob. So most backup programs, including Microsoft's own backup, Windows backup, make a single file. They put all your stuff, they're backing up your hard drive, they put all the stuff into a big blob. That you you don't you you can run programs on the blob to see what's in there, but you can't just look. You can't inspect. You can't randomly run a, a backed up file to see if it's okay. And I just don't think that's okay. I would like to see a backup that looks exactly like the original file structure, folder structure. I can look at an individual file. I can spot check and say, let me see. Does that picture look the same? Yes, that's good. Does that document open up? Yes, that's good. So I'd like that. Now, Kobe and Backup will do that. C O B I A N Soft. Kobeandsoft.com. Again, if you've got a tech guy who's helping you and he says, no, I use Norton and I know how to use Norton, then you might want to stay with Norton because, you know, you, you're you're dependent on your tech guy. But if uh, you might ask the tech person, hey, Leo says he really likes this Kobean. And it, it's free. Do, do you mind if I... It's better. Do you mind? Would you mind terribly if I use this instead? And if he's actually a good tech guy, he might say, well, I don't know anything about that. Let me look. Oh, yes, I like it. Uh, Most actual tech guys will not say Norton Backup is their choice. So, you know. (laughs) But on the other hand, you know, if you're relying on him, as we often are, right? It's unfortunate, but we kind of have to have to (laughs) use what we got. And if he says, no, I like Norton then I guess you got to use it. But then he's responsible for figuring out why it's not working. Not the tech guy. Lot in Florida. Hello, Lot. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi there, Leo. Thank you for taking my call. Thank you for calling. Um, This question is about over-the-air digital TV. Okay. I live in the uh, Fort Lauderdale area where there are close to 40-plus over-the-air digital channels. But I'm finding that even with a 85 or better signal, I still get some digital dropouts. Is really? that normal or? Uh, not if you're getting a strong signal, no. So digital okay. uh, as opposed to analog. Remember, uh, the FCC made right. all the TV stations go digital a year or two ago. And, Correct. And at that point, 
there was something called the digital cliff effect. With analog, the way that they used to do it, it would degrade gracefully. Maybe not so gracefully, but at least it would degrade. So if the signal got weaker and weaker, you'd get ghosting. Remember ghosting in the snow and all the weird artifacts we'd get on TV in the old days? You're giving away my age. <laughs> Me too. I'm, I remember very well. I remember black and white TV. So, uh, <laughs> so you're not that old. So as as you get farther and farther away, you'd still get a signal, but it'd be a, a, a worse signal. Well, there's a point. Digital either generally either works or doesn't. So there's a point where the cliff effect happens, where you'd still get an analog signal, but you get nothing on digital. It just goes black. Now, what you Correct. should not get, especially if you're getting an 85 signal is any dropout at all. And I'm wondering if there's something in the way or maybe is your antenna indoors or outdoors? No, it's outdoors. Um, it's outdoors. It, it, may, be, it the... may be something on the line between the antenna and the TV. Okay. I, I replaced the coaxial cable already. Good. Good. And, um, you know, a solid piece. So there's no cut-ins, no editing. Oh, that's no, good. You know, I didn't put in my end. It's a solid piece that I bought. Are you, uh, are you oh, using an amplifier was... in any way, or are you just taking the signal straight from the antenna? No, the antenna comes with an amplifier. So it is amplifying it. It is amplified, yes. Yeah, there's. I mean, it sounds like you've got plenty of signal where you are. So I'm thinking that there is something else going on, whether the amp is somewhat broken, uh, there's, there's a tree in the way, there's... Uh, uh, maybe a, a, a you know crink in the cable, a crimp in the cable. There might be something going on. Uh, okay, but I'll you should not, check or it could yeah. not. Some of the people in the chat room said maybe your signal's too good. <laughs> and you might turn. Yes, you know what? I hook. I have it hooked up to my TiVo, which uses over-the-air channels. Right. And TiVo said that the signal might be too strong. Believe it or not. Yeah. So maybe turn off the <laughs> amp and see. You might be getting such a good signal that it's overdriving. Okay. I'm going to How try often that. does this happen? Um, at nighttime, when I'm on the major networks, um, it happens on on some of the. In fact, on all the channels, it seems to be dropping out every now and then. That's annoying, isn't it? I'm surprised, and the signal is good. The picture is, you know, everything is good. I don't know why it keeps happening. Yeah, I wonder if it's clipping. I mean, I wonder if it's too strong. So you might take a look at that. Uh, I, you know, this is a this is always hard to diagnose something like this. Um, I, I, it could be a lot of things. You could have a ham next door. You could have, I mean, there's going to be a lot of things. Uh, so I don't know. But it sounds like you're all right. Um, there's a company called Solid Signals that sells a device that lets you turn the signal down. <laughs> a de-amplifier. Maybe that's what you need. I wish there was somebody you could call, you know. Mr. Antenna Guy. He to the rescue. I don't know. I don't know. Um, sorry, I can't be more help a lot. Jeff in Florida, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo, how you doing? I am well. How are you? Hey, you know you and Bill Handle make my Saturdays at work oh. much, much more pleasant. That's very kind of you. Bill does Handle on the Law, great show. Which What does he yeah. call it? Marginal yeah. legal advice? <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, um, I'm, a, I'm a Dish Network customer. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we have these uh, two-tuner HD DVRs in the house, right. a couple of them. Right. And uh, there's an upcoming show I want to I want to record, but I, I don't want it to be locked into that machine to where I can't get it on DVD. I want to uh, keep it because, yeah. you know, these, do these doggone machines, they wear out, they have problems, whatever. Yeah. And you, you, you send it in, you lose everything you've archived on the machine. And this show, I'm going to be on it, I'm part of it, and I want to... I want to be able to keep it. Have you looked at how, the, do, I, how do I do this? Well, you, you know, oftentimes you can't because, uh, of course, think about who doesn't want you to do that. Uh, they're right, they're right, deadly right, afraid that you'll start, uh, you'll make DVDs of those movies you're watching on your dish and uh, sell them on a yeah. blanket in the front lawn and everybody in Florida will have it and you're a pirate. So, right, uh, right, right. <laughs> so it's always difficult to uh, get DVR stuff. You know, it's it's frustrating because you know it's there. It's on that hard drive in the DVR. I would yeah. love to, but they often encrypt it and so forth. Um, That's what I figured. I am not sure. You know, they've got Dish now has this Hopper service. Okay. That uh, is a it's a new HD DVR. Um, you might inquire about that. One of the things it does is so cool is it records all the prime time 
shows automatically for eight days. And then you can okay. you can pick the show you want. It might have some as H as a TiVo to go does some way of getting this stuff off. Uh, so I'd inquire right. about the Hopper. By the way, the Hopper is going to be out of out of uh, business quick because the networks are all suing because the thing the Hopper oh. does, the thing they're advertising is watch commercial free TV. It skips commercials. It's make it's making the ne- the networks are going. Why would you do this, Dish? Why? Why? We hate you. Um, so. Uh, well, you see, I was thinking just to go get an old school VCR. That's another you thing know, you could do. VCR and plug it in. That's the another thing you could do. What people what people what people uh, get up you know want to do is they want a digital recording off the hard drive. But if you're willing to use that's called the analog hole. Pretend you're a TV yeah. set and record it. There's no way they can stop you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. The folks, the fine folks at Ford Motor Company sponsor all our podcasts. We're big fans. Uh, I think partly uh, one of the reasons they like me is because I like them. I'm a Mustang owner. I love it. But now uh, I'm really starting to think, oh, boy, I'm really looking at these new electric vehicles. They just came out, and I was very excited when I saw it for the first time a year ago. But It's now available at uh, Ford dealers, the EV certified dealers, with the Ford Focus 2012, the all-electric. And they have done some amazing things in the technology in these new Fords. You can find out more at Ford.com slash technology. Um, you know, top, top-notch top battery technology gives it things like the longest uh, range of any vehicle in its class, 76 miles between charges. It also has the best-in-class 240-volt charge time. When you get the optional 240-volt charger, you can charge that vehicle from zero to full in three to four hours. And you can even watch the charging at, on your smartphone. They have a smartphone app, which is very cool. It is the most fuel-efficient five-passenger vehicle in America with a 110 MPGE. That's the best city rating in its class. It is just fantastic. Never needs an oil change. These electric motors are incredibly reliable, practically maintenance-free. Uh, the batteries, too. Just really great lithium-ion batteries that uh, are state-of-the-art. Regenerative braking automatically charges the battery as you brake, recapturing 90%, 90% of the uh, energy that would otherwise be lost right back into the battery. It will charge from 120 volts, which is great if you drive somewhere, go to grandma's house, she doesn't have the charger. She can just plug it in. Get an extension cord and plug it in. Uh, it just takes a little larger, longer to charge. I love this, though, on the charge port. It, it lights up. Uh, so you you kind of know what's going on with the charge port. I have to say, they've really, just in every way, they've added little features in big that make this the nicest all-electric vehicle I've ever seen. State of the art. And it's just the beginning for Ford. Next year, the 2013 Fusion Energy, which will be a plug-in hybrid. It has both a gas and an electric energy, which gives you 100 miles per gallon E. Uh, just, I just I just love what they're doing. I want you to check it out. You can go to a Ford dealer right now and drive one. If it's an EV certified Ford dealer, they'll have the new 2012 Focus right now. Take a look at the new Ford Sync and My Ford Touch and the ways they've modified that, optimized it for electrified driving. And then drive one because you know what? You're going to be amazed at the pickup, the get up and go in these vehicles. If you, if you kind of had this idea that, oh, you know, a, an eco-friendly vehicle can't be fun to drive. <laughs> you are wrong, my friend. Ford.com slash technology. We thank them for their support of the uh, Tech Guy podcast. Let me talk to you. If I was your boyfriend, never let you go. Hey, Leo. Keep you on my arm, girl. You never be alone. I could be a Leo. Yeah. Okay, you got a uh, E set live read here. I'm just enjoying the music. Do you see him on the cover of Forbes? Who? Bieber. See, he always sounds like Justin Timberlake to me. On the cover of Forbes magazine, the Biebs. 
friend. You could be my girlfriend. You could be my girlfriend. I don't want to be your girlfriend. Make you dance to a spin and a twirl. Boys going crazy on a hook like a whirlwind. 88. <laughs> He's 18 now, you know. 18 years old, five foot seven. Justin Bieber. Uh, we discovered on YouTube. It's actually kind of a neat story. I mean, here's this kid. Uh, he was 14 at the time, singing songs on YouTube. And uh, so somebody saw it. Scooter Braun saw it and said, hey, you're good. You should come to work for Def Jam. And now he's huge. He's huge. <sighs> 88, 88, ask Leo. That's the number. We're talking tech. Yes, we are. With Bill and Hemet, our next caller. Hi, Bill. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello there, Mr. Leo. Uh, hello. <laughs> How are Can you, you sir? Okay? I hear you good. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, uh, I can hear you fine. Uh, I got a, a online TV uh, thing this morning uh, in my email. It's called Online TV Code, and it's 400, unlock 400 and uh, 4,500 channels. How do you feel about free. Romanian soccer in Romanian? <laughs> How do you feel well, about... That's what you get, by the way. What you're getting, these online... these all There's a number of these. that uh, All there really are, they're not... It doesn't replace a satellite dish. It is giving you... Um, TV, which 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 website was this? Online TV dot com, online TV for you dot net, online for you dot com, online for you dot com. Let me just check. Uh, no, that's not it. It's online TV space. I mean, uh, oh, there's a dash. Uh, dash for Got it. the numeral. You.com. Well, you could tell what an up and up uh, a company this is because they have such a distinguished uh, web address. <laughs> Online TV dash for you dot com. It, it's uh, it's not no, it's a scam. It's not well. I shouldn't say it's a scam. It's not a scam. You'll actually get something, uh, something you could get for free actually uh, because. For the most part, my experience has been with all of these is they're just repackaging. Oh, look. Oh, they put on the front page, top secret. TV software cable companies don't want you to have. <laughs> no hardware purchases, no monthly charges, unlimited TV access, 4,500 channels, a free DVD recorder included. So these are all things you can get anyway. Let's just see what the... Uh, what the the channels are on here. Oh, no, I see. Yeah, you can't. Oh, that's too bad. You actually have to subscribe before they'll let you see what the channels are. You want, you want to know why? Because it's Romanian soccer. Because it's, it's Russian shopping channels. <laughs> it's not anything you want. It ain't HBO. It ain't Showtime. It's not even Cinemax. It's uh, free stuff. By the way, in Soviet Russia, shopping channels sell you. It's a scam, Bill. Don't waste your time. That, again, I shouldn't say scam. It's not. It gives you exactly what they say they're going to give you. There are probably 4,500 channels. The implication is it's 4,500 channels you want to watch. It isn't. Jerome in Myrtle Beach, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. How are you today? I am well. How are you, Jerome? Doing excellent. Thank you. Good. I took your advice last week, and I downloaded the app Blurb on my uh, iPad, which is actually a nice piece of software. This the is uh, for is making three... fo photo books. Right. The problem is I've got three separate computers. I have two Macs and an HP desktop, and I've got all my photos scattered all over the place. Of course, with the HP, I use Picasa and Picasa Web. And then on my Mac, I use iPhoto. I'm trying to figure out how I can consolidate all of my pictures into one program, such as Flickr or something like that. Well, so that's I one way you could do it. Both, both Picasso and iPhoto have upload to Flickr capabilities. So you so could use Flickr. Too. Yeah. Uh, okay. You could also take the iPhoto pictures and upload to, to Picasso Web. You've already got most of the pictures over there. It wouldn't be a big deal to... Uh, 
just to take the pictures in the iPhoto and o- upload them to Picasa Web. In fact, if you download Picasa for the Mac, which is free, it'll right. find those pictures and it'll upload them for you. Okay, and that way I can keep them all in, in the yeah. Picasa folder exactly. and then put those up on the uh, Picasa Web as well. Yeah, because if you're going to use Blurb for those photos, yeah, you want them all in one place. But do remember, you want the highest quality version of those photos you can find. Don't be careful okay. about because if you used, for instance, uh, a thumbnail and you put it in a picture, you would see it would just not look good in one of these photo books. I mean, they're gorgeous books. The, the you want to use the highest quality, highest resolution JPEG you've got. Okay, all right. And I do have one other question too, if I could. Yeah, absolutely. Have you heard anything or any rumors about the new iPhone five? I've got the. Yeah, I've heard a lot of rumors. I don't know if there's any facts to those, but there's a lot of rumors. Well, I've got an iPhone 4, and I'm up due for an upgrade, and I'm, I'm just trying to figure if I should wait a little longer until the iPhone 5 comes out or go ahead and upgrade to the iPhone 4S. If you can wait till September, which is probably the soonest it'll come out, I would wait. Okay. So here's how Apple does this, or seems to be doing it. Every other year is a major upgrade. So iPhone 4 was a major upgrade from the 3GS. The 4S was a minor upgrade. And the reason, it makes sense. They do a y- upgrade every year, but most people have two-year contracts. So the idea, I think Apple's idea is, well, every two years we'll do a major upgrade that everybody will want to trade in their phone for. So you think that uh, the iPhone 5 will come out the fall, in the fall? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure it will come out this year, almost certainly by September. We'll know a little bit in a couple of weeks, or next week, I guess, because of... Uh, June 11th because of WWDC, the Apple Developers Conference. They probably won't talk about the hardware of the phone, but they will talk about iOS 6, which is the next version of the operating system, which will certainly be part of the new phone. So you'll see what some of the capabilities and software will be. And then I could tell you what the rumors are, and I think they're fairly credible. We're starting to see pictures of the case and so forth. Uh, It will be a tall phone, same width, but higher, bigger screen, probably uh, close to a four-inch screen. I think that's going to be a big improvement. It, the, okay. One thing that worries me that may end up ki- uh, keeping me from upgrading is it looks like they're abandoning the traditional Apple 30-pin connector, uh, which we all have many, many cables for because it's been around for a long time, and replacing it with U- micro USB, which is the standard among all phones now. But it means if you have docks, uh, you're going to have to get new docks, that kind of thing. If you don't have a big investment in... 30 pin connector hardware that might be all right okay well listen thank you for everything you do Leo. you're welcome to show every week and i appreciate it thank you for listening i really appreciate it jerome wwdc at the june 11th uh, we will probably hear about new uh hardware uh, new macbooks probably uh those are expected uh we'll certainly hear about the next version of os 10 which is mountain lion We'll certainly hear about iOS 6. It's a conference for Apple developers, so they're going to tell the developers you know, what's new, what they have to change, what's, what's different. But they will almost certainly not reveal details of the phone. Apple does not want to kill sales of the current iPhone by announcing or pre-announcing. The, that's why they're so secretive. In fact, they interviewed Tim Cook this week uh, at the All Things D conference, and Tim said Apple is going to double down on secrecy. I don't know. When you have perfect secrecy, I don't know if you can make it twice as good. But that's really the Apple way. We don't tell anybody anything. We announce it when we announce it. Anything you hear up to that time is pure speculation, and I think that's true. Although, there does become a time when the speculation starts to seem real. And we are seeing now which would... uh, Pictures of the hardware, of the frame, of the back and stuff, which would be very difficult to, to fake. So it's, they're almost certainly for reals. So my, my suspicion is that, uh, that we will see a taller, but not wider, phone. Bigger screen, four-inch screen. It will have a bezel. Not, not, some were saying, oh, it'll be you know, wall-to-wall, side-to-side. No, it doesn't look like that. USB connector. Some, some, some significant changes. So if you are waiting, I would wait. Now, we're going to take a break. Come back with more. So stay here. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I have to take this shirt off. I can hardly breathe. And it's not very flattering. 
What would Leo do? He'd look like a sausage. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Talking computers, the internet, cell phones, home theater, digital photography, and all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the number. 888 827 5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. if you want to call and participate. We were talking before the break about the iPhone 5 and all the rumors. You know, they really it does start to heat up as you get closer and closer. Part, partly because Apple's got to send it to manufacture. You know, they're, the the Foxconn factory in uh, in China just has to fire up. And of course, as soon as you're making something, it's pretty. I'd say it's actually amazing that uh, Apple is able to keep as tight a lid as it is, because there's now tens of thousands of people who have the iPhone 5 in their hands. And it still hasn't leaked out. We're starting to see parts and stuff, but uh, I, I think that uh, it's pretty clear we're we're, we're going to see a bigger screen. We're going to see, uh, oddly enough, a US, micro USB connector instead of the 30-pin connector. I'll tell you, the phone I'm more interested in, is it's delayed right now. I actually ordered one. Uh, it's called the Galaxy S3. It's a Samsung Android phone, and... I think in many ways, this is going to be a very hot phone. Quad-core Exynos processor. It's got the same camera as the iPhone 4S, the 8-megapixel camera that's in the iPhone 4S. It's a Sony part. Uh, we'll see uh, if it looks as good because, as we've learned, it's not just hardware. It's also software, and uh, Apple's got some pretty darn good camera software. No, Nobody on the Android side has yet come close but this this is a this is the camera people are really excited about. I am. I ordered one uh, almost immediately, and we're all still waiting. Although uh, there are some units out there. In fact, uh, there's a company called Chipworks. I think they're a Canadian company that got one and has done a teardown. Uh, that's pretty exciting. The teardown is when they take it apart and they look at what's inside. And that's how we know, for instance that the uh, S3 has the same camera because they take it apart and they look. They say, oh, look what's inside it. This is a very exciting-looking camera. I got. I mean, uh, <laughs> there. that's an interesting slip. It says, <laughs> it's a camera and a phone. The uh, battery is big. It's huge, uh, 21 milliamp hours. Milli what is it? Mil watt amp, amp, amp watt hour? I don't know. what. The anyway, 2100. That's a lot. Quad core processor, 1.4 gigahertz, four of them. Four of them. I don't know if you really need that. That's that's more selling point than anything else. Um, very good graphics chip. NFC, near field communications in the battery. Eight megapixel camera. The thing that I think now sells these phones more than anything is the screen. This screen is almost as high resolution as a 13-inch MacBook Pro. <laughs> Only it's a 4.8-inch screen. <laughs> That's impressive. So no rumor on this. You don't have to guess. This uh, this phone is on its way. It was supposed to come out yesterday or the day before, I guess, uh, and it's delayed because apparently, according to the company I bought mine from, there's something wrong with the blue phone. Like the blue battery back doesn't match. Yeah, all right. All right, so uh, I ordered a white one. I hope I'll get it soon. I can't wait to play with it. But you know, I'm a I'm a little different. I'm a I'm a little unusual. I actually uh, I I'll be getting an iPhone five too. I get I'll get a new phone every few months because it's my job. And I realize a normal person is not going to get a new phone more than every other year. So this is an impressive this is an impressive phone. There's a lot of competition. The problem with Android phones, even if you're just buying Samsung, is that there's a new better phone every few months. And I think that kind of puts off consumers a little bit because they say, oh, "I just bought this phone for crying out loud." For crying crying out loud. 
I uh, and uh, I do, I'm using a Galaxy Note from Samsung, which I like a lot. But it's crazy to have a quad-core processor. It's just, that's bragging rights. But it is fast. <laughs> Sometimes bragging rights aren't so bad. Now, Rick in Escondido, California. Hi, Rick. Leo Laporte. Hey. Tech guy. How you doing, Leo? I'm great. Welcome to my frustration. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell me about it. I uh, got a Windows Vista laptop. Uh, as you mentioned, I have Outlook. It's uh, connecting or supposed to connect to a POP3 server uh, through our cable provider uh, to the email system there. I'm assuming it's probably Exchange. No, it's not. POP3 uh, is different from Exchange. Okay. I thought POP3 was just the connection to the to the server. But no, Exchange has its own protocol, which is actually a, a, a more sophisticated protocol. POP3 is the old post office protocol. And what it does is, as you already know probably, is it stores the email on your internet service provider's servers only until you gather it. And then, in the normal course of events, deletes it. Exchange right. is not that way. Exchange keeps it always on the server. There's lots That's of other true. things. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. So, the problem is, is uh, one day... I launched Outlook uh, as it was coming up or shortly after it came up. I got one of the user access control pop-ups that, hey, uh, program trying to access the Internet. Well, I wasn't trying to access the Internet yet. Um, so you said no. I said no. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's why it's not working. You uh, blocked exactly. it. Yeah. So, so you're really anyway, your question is how do I reverse... Uh, UAC decision. <laughs> That's correct. And I've tried turning off the UAC. I've turned off the firewall. Still gets blocked access. Wow. So I'm assuming it's done something registry-wise that is preventing Outlook from accessing the Internet, but I can't figure out what it is. Wow. Even when you dis Well, see, I think disabling UAC does not disable the uh, choices you have made. <laughs> it only says, exactly. don't bug me anymore. Exactly. Let me, it, yeah, let me, let me check, because uh, that's a really interesting question. How do you reverse a UAC choice? We'll figure it out and talk to you right after this. Why can't I be like all the other kids? They all have three-bedroom homes, broken trucks on their lawns, and cut up hot dogs for lunch. It's not my fault my parents succeed so much. <laughs> There's no one in town I can Is this the Randy Zuckerberg song? I play with autographs. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. While everyone else just plays. 8888 Ask Leo. So I'm gonna I'm gonna recap Rick and Escondido's question, and uh, we, we've been going back and forth in the chat room. Rick uh, uses Outlook to collect his mail from uh, his internet service provider, Pop3. Uh, however, uh, the first time Outlook uh, started, or the first time he tried to do that, he in UAC the user access control, which is what Windows pops up when you try to do something, warned him that somebody was accessing the network, and he said, "Well, block it." And now we can't get mail anymore. Um, there's dissent in the chat room, Rick. Some say, no, that's not UAC. Some say it's your firewall settings, perhaps. Do you have security software on there? I do, and I've turned it off, and I've also added Outlook as an exclusion to the firewall rule set. Good. Still didn't help. Uh, apparently, there is a bug in Outlook. If the temp folder gets filled, Outlook stops working, stops getting mail. So that's another thing you might want to check out. The problem, unfortunately, is there's so many things. Your Outlook, is it say it's offline now? Does it say it's online? I never looked at the status. There is an online, offline setting. Right. Um. You know, it, I just don't. It could be a lot of different things going on. Reversing, I like the original the original question whether it's a, a you know apropos or not of what happens if you block a program in UAC and then you it, in error. What do you, how do you unblock it? And, and the, as I look around, there isn't really doesn't look like there's really an easy way to do that. There's no 
you know, there's shareware out there you can download that will unblock stuff. It doesn't look like there's an easy... It seems to me uh, that it that if you had blocked something at some point, it wouldn't have been UAC. It might have been your firewall. So I would, I would look in the Windows firewall, maybe reset that in addition to whatever else you're running. Okay. Yeah, I, everything that I've looked at and researched online says it, it can't be done. You can't un, you, know, you can't reverse that decision. It's a one-time only. Generally, deal. UAC is for uh, the idea of user access control is to block escalation to administrator. So when a program tries to do something that only an administrator can do, it says, "Are you sure about this? If you're logged in as an administrator, you can just say yes. If you're not, you'll have to give it administrator credentials." It is not blocking permanently blocking internet access that would be a firewall doing that mm -hmm. so i would check your windows firewall and reset it okay i'm betting that that's what you saw that you thought it was uac it's not probably uac is is not going to block internet access however if the windows firewall and it won't by the way uac will not pop up something that says oh something's trying to access the internet the firewall will so it's my suspicion that you go into the control panel, look at the Windows firewall, and reset it. And try that. So many things this could be. And unfortunately, it's difficult to diagnose through the radio. I haven't figured out that technique yet. Hey, Christian's on the line from Norway via phone, so I hope this isn't costing you too much. Hi, Christian. Hello there. Can you hear me okay? I hear you great. I was just in Norway. You have a beautiful country. Where in Norway are you from? Uh, uh, Telemark. Telemark, yeah. My good friend Mikkel Olin has yeah. a home in Telemark. Yeah, it, there's nothing here to see, really. It's so boring. <laughs> I have a complex, uh, complex hardware issue. Okay. So I bought a high-end gaming machine uh, beginning of last year. Uh, it was I bought it, started it up, ran Minecraft for 30 seconds, and it blue screen. And... Uh, I have an i7-950, 6 gigs of RAM, and at that time I had a 470. Uh, the display driver kept uh, not responding and restarting. Eventually I tried the graphics card on another machine, it was broken, so I said that got a 570 now. I've tested two 570 and I have the same issue on both. Once a month they'll start, you know what graphical artifacting is mm -hmm. in games. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'll, I'll have that. Very mildly, once a month, and I have to reseat the graphics card <laughs> once a month. About <laughs> once about. a month, and once a month, you get artifacts. Yeah. Your graphics once a month. start to get a little funky, and then reseating the card fixes it. Yeah, until the next time. And I've I've googled a lot about it, and I haven't I haven't found a BIOS update. I mean, I suppose that the card could be working its way out of the slot inch, bit by bit, and every 30 days or so, it's worked its way out. But see, it wouldn't cause artifacting. It would just stop working. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, uh, I, I think it's overheating. The, um, I think it's overheating. No, it's not overheating. I, uh, I have monitored that. I work in IT, and I know the basic stuff. But it's, I, I have a feeling it's the motherboard screwing mm. up somehow, right? mm -hmm. delivering more power mm -hmm. than it's supposed to. It's the mm -hmm. PCI Express or something. It could I be. I tried finding a it general could. deep hardware diagnostic tool or something like that, but I can't find the proper thing to look at the issue. Yeah, who makes the motherboard? It's an Asus motherboard. I think I can find the box if you want me to. to no, that's all right. Asus, Asus I, does have hardware yeah. diagnostic software. Um... So yeah. it's called Asus PC Diagnostics. You, you're going to do better getting the Asus software because it knows more about the system. Uh, whether it's going to give you a deep enough diagnosis or not, I don't know. But that's the first place I'd go is to Asus. Uh, you might also... Uh, I presume you've done this because you're in IT, but uh, you've updated the firmware and so forth. Uh, I haven't updated the BIOS, not the firmware. I, I think I Googled that, or uh, tried to find updates, but I didn't find any at that time. I haven't tried since. And is it only with Minecraft, or does it happen with... It, it happens with just Minecraft, no, or...? With, 
I think it's especially with World of Warcraft. Um, I have the advanced shadows turned on, and you get one line to infinity. Uh, and other games, the sky will be all weird and things like that. Interesting. It might also be a conflict then, with I, WoW. Oh, no. I wonder if it's a conflict with World of Warcraft. Uh, Web9437 says he has an easy fix. I'm ready to hear it, Web9437. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> he says run a stress test. Uh, yeah, well, uh, if it's uh, heat overheating, certainly that would be, uh, that would be it. Um, he, he is checking the temperatures, so he says he understands that. I'm not sure. Uh, I, it's interesting that the first card failed. I'm wondering, you're right, if the motherboard is not uh, doing something bad. In fact, I wonder if it's going to make this card fail as well. Maybe it broke the first card by, uh, ha maybe there's a small short. Another program that the chat room likes is GPUZ. DirectX has its own diagnostics, which are worth trying as well. You already have those on the system. But there is a video card, lightweight video card utility from techpowerup.com called GPUZ that is also for something like this. That might be worth a try. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It will do a load test. See if there's a PCI Express problem. Which might be. It gives you temps, which is very valuable. Yeah, this looks like this would be at least a start. It's not a deep, you know, testing thing, but it, it'll let you know if the clock is correct, if it's uh, if the temperatures are out of tolerance, uh, if there are problems with the uh, PCI bus. This looks like it would be very, very useful. Thank you for that uh, chat room. That's a that's a good one. Seven. Is that the, uh, you figured it out? Eli figured it out? Yes. So this is the, um... wow, how'd you get live output? Eli, you're brilliant. You're screen capping an iPad. Wow, that's a simple solution, but, but very good. So what you're about to see is a journey beyond space and time. We are about to take off into the Twilight Zone. Are you going to shoot that card? What are you doing? <laughs> wow, that is awesome! Do we have a Do we have a video of the uh, of the floor? I guess not. Wow. So this is the, um, whatchamacallit? <laughs> what do they call this thing? Air, that's right, the Parrot AR drone, which we're reviewing. And the new one, the new AR drone has a, go downstairs! <laughs> the new AR drone has a camera built into it. I wish I could, I could show you what it looks like. It's hovering quite nicely. There it is. So can I get both? Yeah. So there's the view. And there is the uh there's the drone. You could see kind of see the left left middle. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it's going right after Alex. Good job, Eli. You rock. Eli figured out how we could get it uh, live out. <laughs> there it is. So it hovers very nicely. They apparently made some changes to make it a little bit easier to drive. Too bad we don't have that shark anymore. You could attack it. No strings. No, no. It's got four rotors in it. You can see Josh Windish there is, uh, is actually steering it. It's got four rotors in it. And uh, it hovers very nicely. Look at that. I wanted to go outside and take a picture of the roof. Can we do that? It's a good camera. That that looks excellent. All right. <laughs> go outside. <laughs> How far can you go? Uh-oh. That's not a good that's not a good sign. We're seeing the floor. <laughs> oh, there's Eli. 
Be free, AR drone. Be free. Fly free. Born. Ah, it's coming this way. Born free. As free as the. Uh oh. That's not a good sign. Not a good sign. I guess the battery died, huh? As free as the wind blows. You got to charge it up. Did you see the low battery? Kyle Benham, our musical director, he's amazing. He's amazing. He's spinning the discs. If there were discs, he'd be spinning them. And you can get an entire playlist of all the fine songs he plays on each and every show from his Google Plus account, Kyle Benham, B-E-N-H-A-M. Or just go to our website, techguylabs.com. And at the end of the show, uh, James, who's I think got the day off, actually. When he gets back, he will do that. We've been playing in the studio. You know, this is why we spent a million and a quarter on the new Tech Guy Labs studios. We needed a 10,000 square foot studio, not for me. I don't take up much space, but so that we could fly the Parrot AR drone around. That's why we built a million dollar studio. So we've got my my staff uh, is having a lot of fun with the. This is a it's about three hundred dollar thing. It's got four helicopter-like blades in it, and you fly it with a with a um, iOS device, either a phone or an iPad. I guess we were firing it, flying it with an iPad, and it and it hovers. I'm glad you didn't take it outside. It's a little windy out there, so we're just. That's why we built a 10,000 square foot studio is for this. And Eli, thank you, uh, Eli, our intern who is a freshman in high school, figured out how to get live video out of the thing so we could shoot it. This is this is the this is the labs at work. You guys need to wear eye protection. That's all I'm saying. Not because you need it, just because it looks cool. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Uh, coming up in about uh, fifteen minutes. Dick D. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer, our gadget guy. He's the Gizwiz. He'll be here in a bit. But first, Tony, in Orange County, California. Hi, Tony. Hey, how you doing? Well, I'm doing great. How are you? Good. I had a question for you. Yes, sir. I was looking for a home projector, and I was looking at the LG AF-115 and the Mitsubishi HC-4000. Do you know much about those? I do not. You know, I have a home projector. I use an Epson um, uh, Powerlight uh, cinema home projector. I do not know about the... Uh, the LG is an X SXRD, is that right? Right. Yeah, it's very bright. Really good contrast ratio. Um, how how much is it? Well, I saw it. I, it was around a thousand bucks. Wow. That's I have to price, say, huh? I have to say, I've noticed that the uh, these these home movie projectors have gotten a lot less expensive. They've gotten much more affordable. Used to be, I mean, you still can spend fifty thousand dollars on something like a Runco, but unless yeah. you're Shaquille O'Neal, <laughs> you're not going to have that in your home theater. Uh, right. And I, I think for a thousand bucks, you can get some very good projectors. Uh, unfortunately, I, I have not reviewed them all. Um, maybe our home theater guy Scott has an opinion. Um, I, w I would just look around, read the reviews. Uh, the, uh, the LG uses an LCOS uh, projector, not LCD. Right. Uh, and LCOS is good. Uh, it gives you a very, I think, a very good. Uh, in an inexpensive projector, you get very high contrast ratios. It's very bright. I'm not familiar. And what was the other one you wanted to look at? Mitsubishi HC4000. HC4000. So something in that, you know, in that price range. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow, I can't believe how inexpensive these are now. See, it, the LG was uh, <clears throat> was on sale for 9.99. I think it went back up to the regular price. Yeah. They were selling it at like 22.99 or the, something. That's the normal price. Yeah. Yeah. So the um, the Mitsubishi is is not LCOS, it's DLP. Yeah. So there's those are two very different technologies. Um, DLP uses a, a a rainbow spinning rainbow wheel, and mm -hmm. uh, oh now I'm scared. The uh, the parrot drone seems to have flown in here. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Hello, parrot drone. Um, so I, I you know I I think you got to look at them. Is there anywhere you can go look at them? That's the hard part. You can't always find them, right. you know. Right. Um, as far as not wanting to see uh, motion blur, is that an issue with those, or you know? 
Motion blur uh, is going to happen with LCD for sure. Um, DLP has other issues. People sometimes see the rainbow from the wheel, the spinning wheel. And what I'll tell you what, once you've seen it, it's hard to not see it anymore. <laughs> so uh, that's... I, I, my inclination would be to go to go with the LCOS, but you are going to get motion blur with LCOS or LCD. LCOS is pretty fast, but they're not as fast as uh, as a plasma or a CRT. Um, my projector with the Epson is an LCD. It has a, it has LCD. Pro, it's an LCD projector, um, and it, it looks good. It gives you it gives you a very nice of, you know effect. Um, so I would I would say of the two that you just described, I would probably choose the LG based on that LCOS technology. Right. And is there a good place to go research this stuff? Because I've, I've been looking and I'm... Something well, I'd start at hometheater.com. That's Scott's uh, website, hometheater.com, and they do some projector reviews. I don't know if they'll have those particular projectors. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, uh, unfortunately, this is kind of a specialty area. I'm very interested in it because I have set up my own projection system. Another thing that everybody tells me is important is that you get a screen. Uh, were you going to project it on a screen or on the wall, or how were you going to do that? Yeah, I was going to go screen. I just wasn't sure which way to go on that yeah. either. I got a screen, very inexpensive screen, I'm very happy with, from monoprice.com. It's a 120-inch, 10-foot screen. It was only about 580 it was very reasonable. There is an article on hometheater.com. Scott's written, uh, he just posted a couple of days ago, choosing between a projector and a flat panel. And uh, I would certainly read this article because it at least gives you some things to look for and to consider. Okay. Oh, he has wow. some recommendations in the $3,000 price range. He does talk about those mono price uh, screens, I think probably because I bought one. And I thank yeah. Ron Rosberg for recommending it. Um, okay. Uh, you know, I don't know off the top of my head which is a, a better choice, but I would guess that an LCOS would be probably a better uh, choice than an LCD. Hey, which model do you have? You have the Epson PowerLite sixty one hundred, I think. They don't. It's, it's a, out of out of uh, stock. Actually, I think your LCD, your LG, is also out of stock, isn't it? Yeah, I looked on one site that it said um, like it had four different. Uh, uh, descriptions and it said uh, coming into its prime over the hill you know ready to retire <laughs> right. that kind of thing. right well and, the, and certainly there are other things to consider for instance the scaler uh, that's in there might as it gets older might be uh, less uh, sophisticated than some of the newer DSP chips in there um, mm -hmm. you know I, I just I'm not an expert on this and uh, and I, I I don't know exactly who to ask uh, I'll tell you what I'll, I'll ask Scott Wilkinson maybe he'll have some places uh, he can he can point to Okay, and one other question. Um, sure. What about bulb replacement? Is that is that an expensive deal, or is that? Yeah, it's a few can... hundred bucks. Uh, you're going to get on most of these. You're going to get probably three years thereabouts. Um, the lamp on mine is rated for four thousand hours. I've got about fifty on it so far, so I think I'm all right. Uh, <laughs> and but it is it's a fairly expensive replacement. Um, all of them use bulbs of some kind. Uh, some yeah. of them use LEDs, and if you're using LEDs, you won't have to worry about that. But they're not going to be; uh, those are going to be newer and probably more expensive. Yeah. Um, uh, but the the lamp in the uh, in the Epson is uh, four thousand hours, which is pretty pretty good long time. You'd have to watch yeah. a lot of TV to use that up. Yeah. Once you've seen a projector, I think it's tough to go back to a regular TV. Cause you know, I use both because I have to darken the room so much for the projector. But you're right; it's wonderful to have a ten foot screen. There's nothing like yeah. it. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hey, good luck, uh, Tony. And if you do pick one, um, let me know. C call us back, and at least you can give us uh, your review. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. The Gizwiz, Dick D. Bartolo, coming up after these words. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. How are we doing out there with the, uh, the AR drone? Are you still flying the drone? Hey, did, you, did you tire of that, children? Yeah, yeah. How how long does it take to charge? Hour and, a half. hour and a half. Well, we'll be back in an hour and a half with more of the AR drone. <laughs> yeah, you get like ten minutes flying time. Well, an hour is not bad. Come on. Jeez, I thought ten minutes. No, an hour's okay. How much play time do you need?
Last live reads Carbonite. Leo. Oh, I gotta call Dick. Hold on. <laughs> that is uh, Sumo's Indian flute version of the Dick D. Bartolo theme. Leo. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Last uh, segment of the show, and uh, as always on the uh, last segment of the first day, we love to talk to the Gizwiz. Dick D. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer, joins us each week at this time with a crazy gadget. He also hosts a podcast, we should mention, the weekly Daily Hello. Gizwiz. Hello, Dickie D. How are you? I am great. Welcome to the show. You're on the air. I'm sorry it took so long to get to you. I've, oh, that's no problem. We were playing with something I'm going to review on the Weekly Daily Gizwiz at some point. Okay, good. The Parrot AR drone. Have you seen that thing? Oh, yeah. It's neat. Isn't that cool? It's got four yeah. bla- like a four helicopter blades, and yeah. then it floats. It, it actually automatically stays. If you just let it go, it just stays there. But it, you can have go up and down, and the new one has a camera on up it. In the, oh, I've been grinding vegetables with it. Oh, it's good for that too. It's like a Cuisinart. Yeah, yeah, I liked it it's because like a, you could do four different vegetables. It's a fl- at one time. it's a flying Cuisinart. <laughs> Cuisy flight. You ever play uh, Fruit Ninja? It's just like that. You throw the zucchini <laughs> up in the air and <laughs> just wow. chops it right up like that. The ultimate spear hat. <laughs> so Dick uh, joins us every week on the radio show right before we do the podcast to talk about a gadget of the week. What do you got this week, Dick? Well, you know, I have something that you, I think you may already have it, uh, haven't gotten it in the past couple of days, because mine hasn't come. Uh, mine came. Yet. I know what you're going to okay. talk about. Right. We're going to talk about smart cart. Yes. And, and I saw it and loved it at the hardware show. It, it, it's a cart that is so small, it folds up and can become like a little backpack until you get to your destination. You know, you're going to, the one go I got has no backpack loops. Oh, well, you know what? Uh, mine. Wait a minute. I actually wore mine. I put. I saw I put you. You did a video. Something. You know what, Leo? Did you buy the small one or the big one? I bought the smaller one. Okay, I think the big one has. Ah, uh, well, that's fine because I have a handle on it. But what's cool is it's small, it's light, and then you get to the grocery store, you unfold it, and it's a cart with a with a handle and then wheels on it. And wheels. Yeah. And. The company says that you it can carry up to 110 pounds. Well, that's good because I was thinking of having one of my interns wheel me around in it. Uh, get the big cart and get three of them. <laughs> I'll put a leg in one, an arm right. in the other, <laughs> my head in the third. It'll work great. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and it's very reasonable. Uh, the list price is, I think, $30. And you did you get it on uh, Amazon? I did. Because I think it's... 26 or 27 bucks. Yeah, it's from D-B-E-S-T, D-Best. Yeah, dbestproducts.com. <laughs> and it comes in a little bit like our gang. Uh, but uh, D-Best. It's the best. Yeah, yeah the best. Hey, it's we're the, the best. best product. Hey, we're you the know, best. The guy there, Richie, is, uh, hey, we're the best. You know, yeah. I, got a, I got a million patents. Why we wouldn't can- you like it? <laughs> it's, it's good, uh, though. You know what? I got it, and I went to the grocery store. I loaded it up and rolled it home. It was really fun. It worked very well. Good. Okay. Yeah. So smart cart, the small one is, uh, as we said, about 26 bucks. The large one, I think, is probably more like 39 bucks. Uh, black, blue. What did you get? Black, blue, or red? I got red because I want to call attention to the fact that I am now a little old lady wheeling my groceries home. No, you got it because you are showing that you're a green type person. You don't need as many bags right. because you brought something to carry stuff. When I go to my forth. market now... They say, yes. would you like a refund or to donate your money from bringing your own bag? And really? I, I always say donate because it's like it's a nickel. But <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Me- Zabar's is the only uh, uh, place in the city I know that's doing it. If you say no bag, please, they take a dime. Oh, a dime. Off, that's good. Check. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So, you know, you should move to the city, Leo, because it's all twice, the shopping- as, twice as much. <laughs> it's 100% more. <laughs> I can't wait. All right, from D B E S T, but you can find it on Amazon.com, the smart cart. This does not have an engine in it. I can't drive it around, can I? No, no. It has an ergonomic folding handle that slides in it so yeah, that you can yeah. carry it 
uh, very inconspicuously. I, I love it because I go to the warehouse sometimes, but on the way to the warehouse, I stop to get a bite to eat, and then you have to go into a restaurant with a cart. Honey, this thing, you- can I bring my shopping cart in here? No, lady, you can't. Oh, come on. It folds up. How about this handsome folding case? <laughs> oh, yes. Bring Indeed. that in, please. Bring it right in. Dick uh, lives on the web, a place he likes to call Gizneyland. I just call it gizwiz.biz, G-I-Z-W-I-Z dot B-I-Z. Uh, notes there for all of the uh, gadgets that he talks about, um, not only on this show, but on his podcast and on World News Now on ABC and other places. And there's also this game, this What the Heck Is It game, which is... You're is, so good at this. It's in its last you, you month. Just, yeah. um, I think... It just has a robotic feel. This uh, this one. It feels like, I don't know. It's gonna. It's a little walking uh, magazine holder or something. It just feels like it's gonna come to life. It could be. It could be. Oh wait a yeah. minute. That's the picture of you. This is it, the one on the left. <laughs> okay. I don't know what. No, the heck I, I will that come is. to life uh, when we do the weekly <laughs> yeah. daily gizmo. Yeah, that little guy. Oh, the fun one, thing oh, about this oh, contest oh, is you get up to twelve Mad magazines, autographed magazines for the right answer. But there's 24 Mad Magazines autographed by Dickie D for the wrong answer. So yeah. We come reward stupidity. Yeah. It's just like Mad Magazine. Yes. Yeah, it's it's yeah. like the weekly Daily Gizmo. Yeah. What the heck is it? Play the game. Live the dream. The or, dream. Or something. <laughs> something like that. Thank you, Dickie D. Ron is on the line from Fallbrook, California. Hi, Ron. You're our next caller. Leo Laporte. Yes. 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 Um I wanted a uh, recommendation for, I'm a scuba diver, mm. and I've had uh, uh, Sony Cybershot cameras with dive uh, cases, uh, and I'm about ready to get another um, another one. I, I see they do have a DSC WX150 with an 18.2 megapixel, 10 times optical, 20 times image, 1080-60i video. And an Exmor at our CMOS uh, high speed sensor autofocus. Um, but, uh, you know, I want something that would be good and see what your recommendation is. But for, does this uh, Sony have a, have a built in housing or do you have to buy the housing additionally? You got to buy the housing additionally. Yeah. The housing is about 300 and the, uh, uh, and the camera is about 300. Right. And I, uh, uh, I you know, I had DS. Sony DSC 10 with a housing, and I had a DSC W 300 with a housing. Well, and, the truth uh, is, you can get a ho- an underwater housing for almost any camera. So, uh, really, I would choose the camera first, and then worry about the housing uh, later. Um, Sony's are fine, uh, not my favorite cameras. I uh, the biggest issue for uh, underwater shooting, as you probably know, is is backscatter. You pick up. Do you uh-huh. do you use lights under there? How do you? What are you? What are you using? I use. Um, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, the, on the last one I had, I just had a, a flash just from the uh, so, uh, from the cyber yeah. shot. So the flash but the I mean, flash goes have... off, and what happens is it bounces off par- particles in the right. water, and all water, no matter how clear, has right. particles, and you get bright right. lights. You get these uh, dots, and you have to spend a lot of time fixing uh, the backscatter. Um, I don't have a fix for that, but uh, but I, you know, that's something that perhaps a camera might be better at. I actually I do have a fix for it, but it's in software and it's uh, after the fact. There are some programs that will take care of that backscatter kind of automatically, including, by the way, I think the new Photoshop has some features that take advantage okay. of that. Yeah, um, I you know my current favorite uh, is actually the Fujifilm X10, which I've been playing with. Which I really like. The Sony NEX cameras, I think, are marginally better. I think you'll get better results. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the Tech Guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today in our weekly roundtable show, This Week in Tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.